For the message today, we're going to be turning to the book of Hosea. Hosea is a, a book that we've been working through for the last number of weeks. Today we're getting to Hosea chapter 4. And in Hosea chapter 4, we get to um, kind of a transition in the book. So in the first three chapters that we've looked at the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at this relationship between Hosea the prophet and between this woman named Gomer. And God has been using that, that picture, God has been using that as an instrument, a tool, to provide a, a picture of the relationship between him and between his people. With God being held up as the faithful husband and, and the people being held up as this unfaithful wife. Well, in Hosea chapter 4, God leaves that, that image behind, and he no longer speaks through this metaphor, but he begins to speak directly through the prophecy of Hosea. And God comes to them because he has this, this case that he wants to make against them, and he wants to speak to them about their unfaithfulness. And so if you have your Bibles open, we'll be in Hosea chapter 4. It will also be projected above. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, and murder, stealing and adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land dries up, and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea are swept away. But let no one bring a charge. Let no one accuse another. For your people are like those who bring charges against a priest. You stumble day and night, and the prophets stumble with you. So I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I also will ignore your children. The more priests there were, the more they sinned against me. They exchanged their glorious God for something disgraceful. They feed on the sins of my people and relish their wickedness. And it will be like people, like priests. I will punish both of them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. They will eat but not have enough. They will engage in prostitution but not flourish because they have deserted the Lord to give themselves to prostitution. Old wine and new wine take away their understanding. My people consult a wooden idol and a diviner's rod speaks to them. A spirit of prostitution leads them astray. They are unfaithful to their God. They sacrifice on the mountaintops and burnt offerings on the hills under oak, poplar, and terebinth where the shade is pleasant. Therefore, your daughters turn to prostitution and your daughters-in-law to adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they turn to prostitution, nor your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery, because the men themselves consort with harlots and sacrifice with shrine prostitutes. A people without understanding will come to ruin. Though you, Israel, commit adultery, do not let Judah become guilty. Do not go to Gilgal, do not go up to beth Aven, and do not swear as surely as the Lord lives. The Israelites are like a stubborn heifer. How then can the Lord pasture them like lambs in a meadow? Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. Even when their drinks are gone, they continue their prostitution. Their rulers dearly, loved, their rulers dearly love shameful ways. A whirlwind will sweep them away, and their sacrifices will bring them shame. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I mentioned this uh, a couple of weeks ago, but it's important as we get into the prophecy of Hosea, it's important to understand something of the context that's going on in the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel, at this time that Hosea begins his prophecy, they're enjoying a time of immense prosperity. Things are going really, really well. They have these strategic alliances, they have political connections, their kingdom has expanded like it has not in years. They have wealth. They have these trade deals. Everything seems to be going well. They haven't experienced days this good since the days of Solomon. And so we would look at this from the outside, from an external perspective, and we would say things are going really, really well, and yet God comes in this chapter and he says things might look good on the outside, but there's a problem on the inside. God comes to say that there's a rot 
there's a rot that's living in you. There's something corrupting you. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, very, very well-known words. God comes and says, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Now, they knew about God. The Israelites knew about God. They certainly knew who he was. He was still involved in their worship to some way, but, but God is saying, you don't have a knowledge of me. And the knowledge of God is, is this biblical term that's really significant in it, and it kind of describes a, a, a personal familiarity. It, it describes a, a, an intimate, close connection. It's a relationship. And so when you have knowledge about God, then it's kind of a, just limited to a head thing, and, and it's vague, and it's abstract, and it's kind of this, this concept that you have, but it doesn't impact your everyday decisions. Whereas the knowledge of God is a matter of the heart. It's close, and it's personal, and it impacts everything that you do. And the Bible teaches consistently that when you have the knowledge of God, then you have everything. But if you don't have the knowledge of God, then you have nothing. And so this is a hard chapter because God is coming to these people and he's saying, you don't have the knowledge of me. And the scene actually unfolds a bit like, like a courtroom is how you should imagine it. It's kind of like a courtroom and, and, and God is the prosecutor in this case and he's coming and he's bringing his accusations against the people. There's three things, three parts of this court case you could say that I want to look at this morning as we go through this chapter, focusing especially on the first 14 verses. We see that there's this charge that God brings of a lack of faithfulness, and then God follows that up by pointing to, to the cause of that lack of knowledge, sorry, the lack of knowledge, and then finally God describes the, the consequences that come from a lack of knowledge. So we'll start with, with the charge that God has of a lack of knowledge. It's right away in verse 1, right out of the text. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. Now, one of the main things behind the accusation that, that, that God was bringing is God says, you have broken a covenant relationship that I've established with you. This, this is why God is coming to this people and speaking to them, because they've broken the relationship with them. And they've done that by neglecting three things, three things that are, are just necessary for a relationship to exist. God says there's no faithfulness. And that faithfulness is kind of a, a, a word that describes um, truth. It describes uh, in, integrity. That's what lies behind the word. Then God says there's no love. It's a word that's one of the most loaded Hebrew words that we find in the Bible, and it has to do with, with a deep, resounding, steadfast, loyal kind of love. And then finally we read that there's no acknowledgement. Literally it says there's no knowledge of God in the land. Now I want to point out this morning that these are not three separate things. These are not three isolated issues, but these are three completely connected issues that all tie together. Maybe I can use an example from everyday life to try and illustrate this. Some of you here today, you know my wife. Some of you here today, you know about my wife. Some of you just discovered that I have a wife. But I, I feel pretty comfortable saying this morning that none of you know my wife the way that I know my wife. But if I were to go back about 15 years, I would have to say that, that I was one of those people that just knew about my wife. She was a pretty girl that I ran into from time to time. But then we began a relationship. And when we began a relationship, I began to know her. And that's because we began to also spend time together, right? That's how you, that's how you get to know someone. You spend time with them. And, and as I began to spend more time with her, I would discover things that, that made her happy. I would discover things that made her angry. I discovered that there were these things that could make her cry. Actually, quite a few things that could make her cry. Some of you who know my wife know. And, and the amazing thing is that if I look back, you know, I know my wife so much better today than I did, you know, 12 years ago. 
And the cool thing is, is that even now as we go forward, there's still these things that I discover about her that I didn't know. And, and the thing is that as I, as I got to know her more, I began to love her more. And not like that initial hand-holding stage, right? We're in love. Like, like that, that deep kind of love. That love that, that's hard to, to describe. And out of that love, then there, there also flow this desire to be faithful, to, to love her exclusively, to, to have integrity about my relationship with her. My relationship with my wife impacts the decisions that I make every single day. Right? I'm, trying to, I'm trying to root out those things that anger her. I'm trying to root out and get rid of those things that annoy or irritate her. And that's still a work in progress. But I'm also trying to do, I'm trying to do the things that I know please her and the things that bring her joy. And if this is the way that it works in our relationships with each other, why would we think that it's any different in our relationship with God? You know, if you know God as your father, if that's a relationship, then it's impacting the decisions that you, that you make every day. Then you're trying to remove from your life these, these things that would anger or offend him, and you want, from the bottom of your heart, you want to do the things that would please him and, and the things that would bring him joy. You simply cannot say that you know God and then consistently go out and do the things that anger and that offend him. And yet that's exactly what the Israelites were doing. It's exactly what they were doing. If you read verse 2, there's cursing. There's lying. There's murder. There's stealing. There's adultery. They break all bounds. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. And God is coming to them because he wants to make clear. He's saying to them, you know about me. You know about me, but your lifestyle suggests that you don't know me. You know, if we want to apply this passage to ourselves this morning, you know, one of the things that stands out clearly is that if you want to know God, then you have to spend time with him. You have to spend time with him. If you want to know him and, and love him and have this, this faithfulness that flows out of that, then you need to spend time. You need to be in in prayer, you need to be in the Word. You need, to, you need to be doing the things that God would want you to do. You need to be spending time with the people that God would want you to spend time with. Having His decisions impact every decision that you make. I mean, just a point of reflection this morning, just a point of reflection, but think about this. How well would your friendships and your relationships be functioning if you spent the same amount of time on them as you do on your relationship with God? Would we say that our friendships and our relationships might be struggling, or would we say that they would be thriving? Would they be very, very healthy, or would we be a little bit concerned? If we're not truly spending time with God and growing in the knowledge of God, then we should not be surprised when we see sin creep in and take a hold of our lives. I love this quote by John Piper. John Piper says, Too many Christians are fighting graduate school sins with a grammar school knowledge of God. I think that cuts right to the point of the matter. The way that you can destroy your relationship, the way that you end up being separated from God, the way that you end up also being kind of internally destroyed as a church is when the knowledge of God no longer has priority. And God is coming to the people in this chapter and he's saying, that's exactly my issue with you. It's exactly my issue with you. You don't have the knowledge of God among you anymore. And we might be, be looking at this and wondering, well, how does that happen because on the one hand, we see a people where things are going so well, where there's so much freedom and so much prosperity. On the other hand, we see God saying, you don't know me. 
How does that happen? Well, God says, here's the cause. It's the second thing that, that we see in this passage. God says, here's the cause of the lack of knowledge, and he lays the blame directly at the feet of the leadership. And so I certainly think as leaders in God's church, this is a passage that is speaking directly to us. A passage that's calling us out. God lays the blame directly at the feet of the leadership. In verse 4, you have a, you have a verse that's, that's very difficult to actually translate. You see it uh, done different ways. If I were to paraphrase it, God would be saying, let none of you accuse the other don't, don't you point the finger because you're not qualified to do so, but God says, I will point the finger and I'm pointing the finger at the priest. Other versions have it as, my contention is with you, O priest. God says there's a problem at the top and it's flowing out from there. Verse 5, he says, you stumble day and night and the prophets stumble with you. So I will destroy your mother, your mother being a, a reference to the, the nation of Israel. He says, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge because you've rejected knowledge. I also reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I also will ignore your children. The more priests there were, the more they sinned against me. They exchanged their glorious God for something disgraceful. They feed on the sins of my people and relish their wickedness. And it will be like people, like the priests. I don't know how familiar you are with the nation of Israel, but of all the pr people, the priests had an amazing calling. Of all the people, the priests had, had the privilege of being priests. Not just anyone could be a priest. They had to be from the tribe of Levi. They were called by God. They were given a, a position by God. They had this great calling. They got to represent God to the people. That was their job. And they got to represent the people to God. And they, they were able to call people to follow God. And they were constantly pointing to God. And they had this great responsibility of teaching the people about God. Praying for the people. Being burdened by the sins of the people. Sacrificing for the sins of the people. They were the ones who were called to be an example to the people of God. It was amazing. But it was also difficult. It was a difficult job because it was exactly when things were prosperous, when things were going well, that they had to hold the people accountable. It was exactly when the people were saying, hey, things are so good, we don't need God, that the, the priests, the leaders had to come and say, no, the one thing that you need is God. You can have all of these things, but if you don't have God, it doesn't matter. It was exactly when the, pre when the people were saying, well, it's so good, we'll just live how we want, that the priests had to come and say, no, you can't just live how you want. And so instead of going down this difficult road, the priests had taken the easy road. They'd taken the easy road, and they had decided to reject the knowledge of God. They decided to ignore the law of God. We're told that not only did they reject the law of God, but they actually kind of delighted in the sins of the people. Instead of being burdened and weighed down by the things that they saw happening around them, the people took delight in them. It's actually a very sick picture of the priests. People who delighted in the sins of the people. It says they fed off the sins of the people. And the Bible there, it's, it's providing a picture of, of, of these sacrifices that the people brought for sins. That's the image it wants you to have in your mind. It's saying these people, when they sinned, they had to bring sacrifices. And so, so the priests, they were looking at this, and they were saying, well, the people are sinning a lot more. They're bringing a lot more sacrifices. We get a portion of each sacrifice. The sin is working out pretty well for us. Instead of preaching the word of God and, and teaching the people of the word of God, the, these people these priests were more concerned about feeding themselves. And I think there's a lesson here for us that says when the people, the priesthood, the leadership, when they are more concerned about themselves than they are about God or about the people they're called to lead, 
you're going to have a people that are destroyed from lack of knowledge. When the leadership of a church, I don't care which church it is, when the leadership of a church decides to run on, on the idea that their thoughts and their wisdom are more important than God's thoughts and God's wisdom, then the people are always destroyed from lack of knowledge. Albert Einstein, he once said, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and somehow expect a different result. And yet when you look back, when you look back over the course of history, you see the people of God doing this time and time again. It's insanity, it's madness. And it is a madness that we see happening in our time today. Leadership that feels that they don't need to run on the authority of the word of God. Leadership where we feel that, that our insights and our wisdom are somehow superior to God's insight and God's wisdom. Proverbs 2.6 says, for wisdom comes from the Lord. From his mouth come teaching and knowledge. And yet there's so much insanity, madness, even among the world of Christianity today. And part of the reason that happens is because our natural inclination, our natural tendency is to reject the knowledge of God. Yours, mine, everyone is to reject the knowledge of God, to reject faithfulness, to reject love. And that's why the gospel, that's why the gospel rests. It rests on the person and on the work of Jesus Christ. It rests on the person and the work of Jesus Christ because we as human beings are never going to produce a leader that's qualified to truly lead. We're never going to have a leader, the greatest leader of any church is never going to know God as well as he should. And God says, well, I love you so much that I'm going to send you my son. I'm going to send you my son because he knows me. He knows me in a perfect way. God says, I'm going to send you my son because he loves me with the kind of love that you can't even find a word for. God says, I'm going to send you my son because he's faithful to me. He's willing to do the difficult things even when it's not always popular. That's why Paul calls Jesus the wisdom from God, 1 Corinthians. If you want to have the knowledge of God, you must come to Jesus Christ. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 17. He says, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know you, and they know that you have sent me. Listen, I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. That I may be in them. Jesus here is talking about the spirit that he gives. And the one thing that a leader among God's people needs is the spirit of God. Without it, you're nothing. You're just nothing. But with it, you reflect the character of Christ. With it, you're burdened the way that Christ was burdened by the sins of the people. Christ never took pleasure in it, but he took those sins on his shoulder and he carried them to the cross. Christ didn't profit from the sins of people. He bled for the sin of the people. The character of Christ just shines through as someone who is more concerned about others than he is about himself. So much so that he was willing to lay down his life for sinners. More than ever, more than ever, the church needs godly leaders. People filled with the Spirit of God, relying on the knowledge of God, reflecting the character of God's Son. Whether that's pastors, whether that's elders, whether that's deacons, whether that's small group leaders, youth group leaders, we need people who are built on the knowledge of God. 
growing deeply in the knowledge of God. And the way that you do that is by discovering him as he's revealed himself in his word. You need to have people who are built not on their wisdom, but on God's wisdom. J.C. Ryle. J.C. Ryle has this quote. It's fairly lengthy, but once in a while you come across one that's so valuable that you have to include the whole thing, so forgive me. He says, The true Christian was intended by Christ to prove all things by the word of God. All churches, all ministers, all teaching, all preaching, all doctrine, all sermons, all writings, all opinions, all practices. These are his marching orders. Prove all by the word of God. Measure all by the measure of the Bible. Compare all with the standards of the Bible. Weigh all in the balances of the Bible. Examine all by the light of the Bible. Test all in the crucible of the Bible. That which cannot abide by the fire of the Bible, reject, refuse, repudiate, and cast away. This is the flag which he nailed to the mast. May it never be lowered. If we want to be a church built on the knowledge of God, if we want to avoid being a people without knowledge, build yourself on the wisdom that God offers through the spirit that God offers. And if we don't do that, then there will be consequences. I just want to close with a couple comments on that. There are consequences for a lack of knowledge. And I think you could just summarize the consequences with this statement. The consequence of a lack of knowledge is that you are left with a hole in your heart that only God can fill. The consequence of a lack of knowledge is that you are left with a hole in your heart that only God can fill. If we look at verse 10, this is exactly what happens. They will eat but not have enough. They will engage in prostitution, but they will not flourish. Because they've deserted the Lord to give themselves to prostitution, old wine and new wine, they take away understanding. What you have here in these words is just a picture. It's just a picture for us of what life looks like when you don't have the knowledge of God. Right, think about this. These Israelites had so much. So much. So many good things. They were living at, at, the, at the top of their time. Things had never been better. And yet God says to them, you have all these external things, but it won't solve an internal problem. You can have all of these things that you desire, chase after all these things, but you won't ultimately be satisfied. And some of you know Exactly what that's like. You know that feeling. People are out, these Israelites, and they're acquiring things, and, and they're experiencing things, and they're eating, and they're drinking, and they're doing all these things. They have all these gods that they could pursue, and it was, don't kid yourself, it was attractive. It was so attractive to pursue the things. These other gods, they were looking to the wooden idols, the diviner's rod, they were sacrificing on the mountains, and burnt offerings on the hills. These are all terms that describe the worship of the gods of the nations that surrounded them. Very, very tempting. One of the reasons why is that a lot of these religions were highly sexualized. That's why the chapter's speaking constantly of prostitution, turning to temple prostitution. These things were wrapped up in the worship of these other gods, and it was attractive and God says, you can go that road, you can do those things, but it's going to be empty. And if that's the picture that God offers in this passage, then it's also a picture we should apply to ourselves today. You know, sometimes you ask yourself, well, why does God have a passage like this with such a hard warning? Well, I think there's two reasons why. The one is God wants to remind us that throughout time, the heart doesn't change. And we have a heart that's inclined to be unfaithful. We have a heart that's inclined to reject the knowledge of God, to reject the love of God. Very easy, isn't it, right? Very easy to read stories like this, stand at a distance, say, wow, that's rather interesting. It's not the point of the passage. The point of the passage is to say, are you different? The point of the passage is to say, is this church different? We're surrounded by so many good things. There's so much. We have these gods of, of wealth and we have these gods of power and of fame. 
these gods of greed, these gods of sports, and there are people here that bow down to them, that worship them. It's the most important thing in their lives. And perhaps the reason that we see Christianity in decline, especially in the Western world, is because the truth is that there are a lot of Christians who are seeking their satisfaction elsewhere. Andy Stanley, I came across this last week, Andy Stanley says this, the church should stop expecting the outsiders to act like insiders when the insiders act like outsiders. The reason God brings this warning is because he wants to say, I want you to live like the people of God, to be the people of God. But the other reason God brings it is because he's gracious. God warns because he's gracious. Do you know how long he gave the Israelites? Years and years of prophecy. Hosea prophesied for 40 years. 40 years to turn back. I don't know what your situation is today. I don't know if this is the first time that you came through these church doors or whether you've been coming through them for a long time. But they are a warning nonetheless for one and all. God says, I want you to turn back to me. I want you to love me. I want you to know me. I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. God says, all these other things that you pursue, all of these external things that you spend your life running and trying to acquire and trying to experience, they will all melt away, but one thing will remain. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that you might know me or that you might know God and Jesus Christ, his son. That will remain. And the way to know God is to know his son. And when you know his son, then God will remove from you that spirit of prostitution that lives in you. And he will replace it with the spirit of God. And the spirit of God will open your eyes so that you see so that you no longer see God in the abstract, that he's not just something you read about, he's not just something that you know some things about, but that he's a father to you. He's a father that you know and that you love and that you're faithful to, and through Jesus Christ, you know what it's like to be known and to be loved and to have a God who would be faithful to you. Our prayer is that you would just experience that grace and that love and heed God's warning today. Let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we, we thank and praise you for this day. We thank and praise you for the time that we've been able to spend here, a beautiful day, a day where we get to celebrate so much of your goodness and of your kindness. Father, you are the God who knows. You are the God who loves and that is faithful. And we don't need any clearer example of that than you've given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you would love us enough, that you would be that God who shows unfailing love to unfaithful people, that even when our hearts are inclined to do evil, that you reach out and you touch our lives so that we are able to produce good. Instead of doing what you hate, you change lives so that more and more we start to do what pleases you. We pray that that would be the attitude and that spirit that lives in this place. We pray that especially here as a church family that we would be built on the knowledge of God, that we would not be led by our own wisdom and our own insight, but that it would be you and your insights that reign supreme. That we're not reigning by our own strength and our own power, but we're relying on your strength and on your power. Father, we pray that this day, as we worship and as we conclude this morning, that you would move that your spirit would be in this place, that you would bring us to a sense where we know you in a very personal, intimate way. And we pray that we would spend time with you, loving you, being in prayer, being with the people you love, trying to do everything for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.